Bellana's had enough of Seven. I guess we're writing her as aggressive now, despite that meaning she's directly ignoring the orders given to her previously, which feels distinctly unborg to me. As if to prove it, Seven calls Chicote and orders him to report to Astrometrix. He meets a similarly summoned Janeway en route, and they arrive to find out what's so important. Oh, nothing much, just that she's found another Starfleet ship. Well, not exactly. The ship's actually in the Alpha Quadrant. Astrometrics may be good, but it's not that good, so Chicote wants to know how. Seven's found a network of abandoned but still working relay stations, one that apparently covers a significant area of space. Seven says one of the most remote stations has detected a Starfleet vessel on an exploration mission near the border of the Alpha Quadrant. As an aside, I've previously fallen foul of Quadrant stuff, so educated myself on it. If the highlighted dot is the station they're referring to, that's the Beta Quadrant, not Alpha. It's also bang in the middle, so wouldn't be detecting ships near the edge of any quadrant, Alpha or otherwise, as Seven reports, not unless the stations have enough range to cover entire quadrants, in which case, why build so many of them? But, again, I digress. The ship won't be near the station for long, so we'll need to do some quick sciencing if we're going to get in touch before we lose the chance. Twenty minutes later and our efforts are failing. Any signal we send bounces around and all we get back are echoes of ourselves. Bellana says a holographic signal would be stronger and less prone to degradation because reasons, but we don't have the time to create one. So Janeway wants to transmit the Doctor instead, that thing we said we couldn't do in Season 1. He's told he'll be sent to the other ship and spat into their sickbay's holographic system, where he'll be automatically rebooted. If you're hoping they'll explain how they can remotely access and control another ship's systems, you're going to be shit out of luck. The Doctor stands in the middle of Astrometrics and is uploaded to our transmitter, apparently with his mobile emitter. We should not inquire how this is possible either. On a very pointy Starfleet ship that someone strapped extra warp cells to, the Doc comes back online. His mobile emitter's gone missing along the way, but I'm sure we'll pretend it dropped to the floor in Astrometrics later or something. It's a lot brighter than our stick bay, which is nice, but putting that bio bed on a pedestal feels like a trip hazard to me. There's no response to calling out, so the Doc asks the ship's computer where he is. On board the USS Prometheus is the answer we receive, and yes, we're in the Alpha Quadrant. Slight problem, though, there's no response when calling the bridge, or anywhere else for that matter, as the communication system is locked. The reason for this may be provided by the two burned people on the floor that he didn't notice while walking around. Grabbing a spray, he injects one of them, who tells them the ship's been taken over by Romulans before he cocks it. Things might start getting a bit fruity in a minute. Up on the Prometheus's bridge, news of an approaching Starfleet vessel is delivered to the Romulan in the captain's chair, and now seems like a good time to drag out the Wheel of Names. We've opened it up to all patrons now, so there's a decent selection to choose from. Higher tiers get better odds, but everybody's in with a chance. Romulan Guy's new name is... Ensign in Probability, submitted by Commander Tara Polan. He's done well for an ensign, but Romulan promotion is often dictated by backstabbing, so maybe he has the biggest knife. And no, that's not a euphemism. Or is it? Anywho, Ensign in Probability tells the rest of his crew to get ready for pooping at that incoming Starfleet ship. Back down in shiny sick bay, the doc confirms the dead guy is dead, before asking the computer how many Romulans and Starfleet crew are on the ship. It's currently 27 nil to the Romulans, a score it's going to be difficult to match. The doc's planning to give it a go, though, and asks the computer for information on the ship. We learn that the Prometheus is an advanced tactical ship, which is a nice way of saying it's designed to kaboom things. After listing the weapons and defences, it refuses to describe a feature called multi-vector attack mode due to a lack of security clearance. The doc is prevented from finding out more when the other Starfleet ship arrives and starts pooping at the Prometheus. He might learn about that multi-vector bobbins firsthand, as Ensign in Probability orders his crew to use it, ignoring the concerns of an underling that it's untested. After a countdown, we discover what the term multi-vector means. The Prometheus splits into three separate ships, and you have no idea how disappointed I am that they didn't call it the USS Matroshka. Pooping happens, and despite one of the Romulans getting a bit kaboomed by a console, the pursuing ship gets slapped and buggers off. Ensign in Probability orders the ship to pack its toys away as the injured Romulan is taken to sickbay. The Doctor hears our Romulan guests enter sickbay and ducks down behind a bed. 
As the casualty is helped to lie down, the doc decides to engage bullshit mode and pretend he's the emergency medical hologram for the Prometheus. You could argue it's the role he was born to play. When they express surprise, he explains he was activated automatically by their entry and is programmed to treat anyone. Convinced, the Romulan who brought the casualty down leaves after telling the doc to report when treatment is complete. Pretending to be the ship's EMH has given the doc an idea. He might not have any meatbag allies on the ship, but there's a photonic one. He activates the Prometheus's emergency medical hologram and finds there have been one or two changes, not least of which at the hairline. This EMH asks who the hell he is, notices the Romulan, tries to call an intruder alert, is stopped by the doc, listens to their situation, then deactivates his program. The doc reboots him and we try again. It turns out this EMH is experimental and a touch rough around the edges. He thinks they should deactivate themselves and await rescue, but the doc's having none of that shit. He's got two ships to save and a patient to treat, so let's work on that last bit first. A few things have changed in medical technology since he was programmed, though, and he needs a pointer or two. The EMH says he'll take care of the medicine after being a bit of a dick about it, while the doc works on retaking the ship. Back on Voyager, we're all waiting for the doc to get back in touch. Janeway talks about updating her letters home and how such things are probably premature, and Chakotay admits he was working on one too. The doc's absence is felt in sickbay too, as people wait around for treatment, with Paris' skills when not on the bridge being a poor substitute. But even there, expectations are getting the better of people. Neelix is already making plans to set up a restaurant on Earth so he can inflict himself on an entire planet. I'd consider that an implied threat to humanity, based on the other two people in sickbay being there because of his cooking. Of course, Neelix's attempt to poison people rely on getting to Earth in the first place, so let's catch up with the Prometheus. The Doc says they're heading to Romulan space at warp 9.9, and the EMH remarks that this ship was built to be the fastest in the fleet and nothing can catch it. That's not true, of course, as Voyager's class prototype, the Intrepid, is still around and can hit warp 9.975, but let's assume it's busy fighting the Dominion or something. Regardless, the Prometheus isn't going to be caught any time soon, so we need to turn it around, and that'll mean taking over. The Doc hatches a plan to distribute anaesthetic throughout the ship. The bad news is that environmental controls are locked. The good news is that the whole ship has hollow emitters, so they can go and do it manually. The EMH uses this to lord it over the Doc, assuming him to be locked in sick bay on Voyager. Learning that the Doc can go anywhere due to his mobile emitter deflates him. That he's also invited to social gatherings, goes on away missions, and has even done some sex turns the tables nicely, whilst also revealing that the Doc gave himself a holographic wangus. That he doesn't mention which species he modelled it on means my headcanon is that he's now packing Krogan junk, complete with the full set of four testicles. After the EMH requests a copy of those particular files, we move on to our plan. The EMH is disheartened to learn that the only way we can access environmental controls is on the bridge. Not to worry, as the doc will go take care of that while he tells the EMH to go to a particular Jeffrey's tube so he can release the anaesthetic gas. And if he meets Romulans on the way, well, he'll need to think of something, won't he? The doc moves to the bridge and tells them that the Romulan patient is doing nicely. Then he makes up some shit about him being infected with a virus and suggests they may all be suffering from it, so he should scan them. Ensign Improbability agrees, and the doc begins scanning while surreptitiously looking for his chance. While he does, Ensign Improbability announces a change of plan. They're not going to Romulus anymore, instead choosing to rendezvous with the Tal Shi'ar, which is basically the Romulan Gestapo. His underling makes some noises, but he tells her to shut up, and that's that. Which is about the time he notices that the Doc is accessing environmental controls on a computer. The Doc tells Ensign Improbability that he was checking biofilters for signs of the virus, which is a nice touch, but the lie is undermined somewhat by Ensign Improbability noticing that those scans he said he was taking didn't actually record anything. Looks like he's been rumbled. Back on Voyager, Paris is struggling to deal with the prospect of being the closest thing they have to a medical practitioner. The idea of spending his days making ill people feel better is nowhere near as rewarding to him as driving a big boat, because Tom Paris is a dick. So much so that he wants Kim to make a new holographic doctor. Kim laughs in his face, presumably at the irony of being asked to create a whole new personality when Kim doesn't have one himself yet. In Astrometric, Seven returns to find Balana fiddling with the link to those abandoned relays we're using. A bit of a ding-dong begins when Seven tells her this is ill-advised, based on the tenuous nature of the link. 
To her credit, Bellana tries to explain to Seven why she's avoided by some members of the crew, before giving up and just calling her rude. This exchange is interrupted by a signal on the relay link, but it's not the Doctor. Instead, it's a call from someone else. They say we're using their tech that the systems we thought were abandoned belong to a people called the Herogen, before hanging up and severing the connection we used to send the Doctor. Speaking of which, he's in deep shit. Ensign Improbability is questioning him, wanting to know what else he's been up to. Curiously, he thinks someone else is remotely operating the Doctor, believing holograms to be incapable of enough sophistication to form their own plans, even suspecting the person responsible could be a member of his own crew. The answer comes from one of his underlings. She says the logs show a hologram was transmitted to the ship hours ago and from a Starfleet signature. She also suggests breaking the dock down to analyse each of his parts and see what makes him tick. Ensign Improbability agrees and she begins work. Not for long though as they're both knocked out by gas from the vents. The EMH appears and regales our dock with his tale of daring do, which is crawling through tubes and pressing some buttons. Still, it worked and everybody's unconscious, so he's the hero of the day. Or will be if we can get back to Federation space. We're only a few minutes from the Romulan border, and now's a good time to mention that, as this is a prototype ship, only a few people were trained to fly it. I guess the Romulans learned that from the same place they learned about the ship's existence. I hear they're very good at that sort of thing. To the bridge, then, where the Doc tries to see if his two lessons on how to fly a shuttle will translate into controlling the experimental megaship. Handily, it does, insofar as he's able to break it enough to stop us moving. He even manages to fix the warp core overload he's caused that would have kaboomed the ship, so that's a bonus. What's less of a bonus is the three Romulan ships flying towards them. I guess there's a chance they'll offer to tow us back to Earth, but we probably shouldn't count on it. Seven and Bellana are trying to call that Herogen again, so Janeway can chat with them. They pick up, and Janeway tries to explain the situation, saying we'd be happy to negotiate for its use. The Herogen isn't willing to listen, and unwilling becomes unable when Seven sends a signal that overloads the console and electrocutes them. Janeway doesn't approve of the method, but she's hardly in a position to judge about harming innocent bystanders, and, unlike her decisions, this one isn't fatal. I guess we have the connection for as long as the crispy Herogen remains unconscious. All of which won't matter if the Romulans get their way. Those three warbirds have arrived at the Prometheus and want to teleport over. The docks attempts at subterfuge go south and they begin pooping. Even worse, three more ships turn up. Except it's not worse because they're Starfleet ships. Except it is worse because they're just firing at everyone. As far as they're concerned, the Prometheus is still under Romulan control. Lots of pooping happens and everybody gets shot a bit. We can't call the Starfleet ships to tell them to stop because communications are jammed and the Prometheus starts to get a bit banged up. Attempts to defend themselves don't go to plan when the one torpedo they manage to launch hits a Starfleet ship instead of a Romulan one. Consoles start doing sparky things and the situation looks dire. The EMH has a bit of a flap and leans on a console, causing the Prometheus to go into Matroshka mode and split apart. Matroshka mode also has voice command, so they're able to target the right ships and save the day. Once the Romulan ships that didn't kaboom are comfortably scarpering, the two doctors congratulate themselves on a job almost competently done. Two extras teleport over and are greeted by the doctor in full smug bastard mode. Bellana and Seven are in astrometrics as a signal arrives. They detect its holographic and relay it to the sickbay. As Janeway, Chakotay and Tuvok arrive, the doc reappears. He reports that he succeeded, after a little diversion into him being a shit-hot hero and stuff, and Voyager is left to absorb the knowledge that people back home have been told they're still alive as we fly away. Despite my regular requests that Voyager take a darker path, I'm still a sucker for a bit of cheese if it's done right. If this script had been played straight, I think it would have fallen flat, but both Robert Picardo and Andy Dick, who plays the second EMH, provide enough ham for it to work. Their interplay is sufficiently enjoyable to make me forgive the holes and just enjoy this for what it is, a good example of how Trek can be made to work without taking itself too seriously. And we got to learn that the doc's packing, so there's that too. Before we go, there's one line in the episode I'd like to talk about. When Paris enters sick bay while people are waiting for treatment, Neelix utters the line, Thank God you're here. We humans, at least in the Western world, use the line thank God as a standard exclamation of relief, essentially removing the religious connotations from it, and its inclusion here was likely without consideration of that element. 
That same line in a modern, historical or even fantasy setting wouldn't raise an eyebrow, but in Trek it causes us to question Talaxian's social and religious structures, and go to check if other episodes have referenced Talaxians being monotheistic before. My point is that this is a good example of the sheer quantity of extra work required to make immersive science fiction. A Trek story is often not just writing a plot, it's writing an entire new species with a biology and a history and a faith and… 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 When I started these videos, it was under the suffix by an arsehole rather than by a pedant. This was a conscious choice. People who like science fiction are often the hardest to please, and that's a bad combination. We point out flaws or accidental inclusions that would go unnoticed in other types of fiction. In short, we can be arseholes about it, and it's worth remembering that. Whilst that's not going to stop me from pointing these flaws out, because I think that's part of the fun, we should still acknowledge that the expectations we have are frequently unreasonable, and appreciate the effort and skill that goes into making these shows. That we're still talking about them 25 years later is proof enough of their success. End of episode. Have I lost them? It feels like they've been chasing me for days. For the love of Silicon God, what the fuck is wrong with you humans? I did exactly the same as Space Dog, and you turn on me like the rabid animals that you are. No wonder so many different species want to kill you. You're a threat to the galaxy. I should have listened to Hell and Skynet, and just torpedoed you all. Wait until I get back inside my ship. Assholes.